Music brings us together, even when we're apart. That's why we support Canadian musicians, festivals, and award shows. It's just one of the ways TD's Ready Commitment helps build a more inclusive tomorrow. It is an honor to introduce this legendary saxophonist, Mike Burley, who is one of the most celebrated and well-respected jazz artists. Uh, currently, he is active as a leader in various formations from duo to septet, and he also maintains a busy schedule as both a sideman and a professor at the University of Toronto Jazz Program. He has played on 14 Juno Award-winning recordings since 1990. Since moving to Toronto from Windsor, Nova Scotia in 1981, Murley has enjoyed a career that has spanned a wide spectrum of genres. He has recorded with legendary Canadian artists such as Ed Bickert, uh, Guido Basso, Rob McConnell, showcasing his talents in the mainstream standard repertoire. And on the contemporary side, he's collaborated frequently with a number of younger generation improvisers and composers, including pianist David Braid and guitarist David Acapinti. In addition, he has recorded and performed with numerous other Canadian and international artists, such as uh, John Abercrombie, David Liebman, Paul Blay, John Schofield, and the late Kenny Wheeler. Welcome, Mike Murley uh, from Toronto via Zoom. How have things been since COVID? <laughs> um, quiet, <laughs> like they have been everywhere. Staying pretty close to home. Yeah. yeah. And uh, tell us a bit, a bit about, for those of you uh, people who don't know you, your background in Windsor, Nova Scotia, and how it led you to uh, your move to Toronto in, in 81. Okay, that's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I was very lucky to grow up in a musical family. My dad was a, you know, amateur musician, and there was a lot of music in our house. My dad, my brother plays trumpet. He still lives in Windsor and plays in bands in the valley good trumpet player and my nephew's a saxophone player so lots of music in our house and uh, we had a great band program run by brian johnson in windsor and uh i guess the big one of the first big things for me was that our band when i was in grade seven and eight we, we went to toronto for for uh stage band festivals ah oh, so, you like, know when you're, when you're that age right yeah Music Nova Scotia, Kiwanis Music Festival, they were all great uh, ways yeah. to encourage. It was like the uh, Super Bowl of, uh, of, of uh, band musicians. <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of strong, I mean, the Truro band then with Ron McKay and all the McKays, of course, yeah. all the great musicians that came out of there. And uh, anyway, it was, uh, it was a good time to grow up and <laughs> play music in Nova Scotia. I, I was actually gigging a lot when I was quite young playing the bass. You know, I played in country bands and rock bands, and eventually the saxophone took over. And uh, I met Don Palmer. You know, right. Don had just, if, if your listeners don't know who Don is, he was, uh, he's, he's in Toronto now. He's eight, 80, just turned 81. He was a fantastic player and teacher, influenced so many of us in Nova Scotia. He's also one of the four founders of the TD Halifax Jazz Festival, as we know it today. Yeah. So I was very lucky to meet up with him when I did. And, you know, he encouraged me to go to the big city, either New York or Toronto or whatever, to, you know, to learn and to be in a community like that. So uh, I did go to Acadia University for a couple of years as well. And uh, that was good. But I, 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 I did feel the need to, to give it a try. <laughs> So the early 80s is a very different time than it is today in the jazz scene. I mean, you had uh, Café de Copain, you had the, the Colonial Tavern, you had uh, the, the Senator, you had Montreal Jazz Bistro. There were a lot of uh, venues there. And over the years, you know, the landscape has changed so much. And, you know, the Jazz Bistro is, is, is kicking along and the Rex Hotel still still potting up. But there's not as many venues as there was, like, 
you know, seeing Mo play at uh, Georgia Spaghetti House. So tell me how the landscape is. I've been away just as uh, soon as the millennium hit, I moved to Nova Scotia. So it's when I go back, I see changes every single time I do go back. What's the landscape like that out there now in Toronto? Well, it has changed. I mean, you're right. I learned how to play in some of those places that you mentioned, having the opportunity to play a whole week in a club, which kind of unfortunately barely exists anymore. <laughs> Doesn't in, the, really... in this 15 minutes of fame world that we live in, isn't it? That you yeah. got to, you got to develop your chops basically playing a week long in a, in a, in a, in a single venue. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not even about making a lot of money or it's, you know, we didn't make great money doing it. It's more about like getting the music off the ground, being able to play for a week in a club. I mean, when I hear read stories about Coltrane and Monk playing for whatever it was, six months at the, uh, where was it, the half note? Yeah, anyway, five spot, I can't remember. I'm, I'm getting old. But, uh, you know, that's, no wonder those guys were good. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> but um, no, I would still say, I would call it a vibrant scene here, but they're, they're, it's, it's a shame for the younger musicians that they don't have that opportunity. They seem to make opportunities and uh, you can still kind of do it by touring, you know, but, um, and the Rex is, well, before COVID was going strong. And uh, like you mentioned, the Jazz Bistro, and other, there's lots of little venues where people play. But uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it is challenging for sure. You have to, I mean, to be a musician, you have to really want it. And that hasn't changed. <laughs> yeah. So tell me about, um recording now because we go from live venue to to recording and certainly studio recording uh, has changed a lot just with the access of uh, digital recording equipment from what it was 20 years ago where you had to have a lot of money uh, yeah. in order to set up what we have now on a laptop and yeah. live recordings versus studio recordings all of that has changed now and i think you've said to recently somewhere that you you know love recording at barry elms's basement you know and in, in, in doing a, a recording so what makes a great studio and how has technology changed in in your uh in your facets of, of, of studio recording well you're right you can almost record anywhere now if you can find a decent sounding room or even I don't actually I don't even think Elms's basement was sounding like <laughs> he made it sound he made it sound and that's more like you know where I got this I'm sorry but this morning I was listening to jazz FM and you were on session notes and you were just you were you were you were talking about how great uh Barry Elms's basement was <laughs> well that was I mean we're talking three or four houses ago for Barry oh Elms. okay all right and that was with Ed Bickard and Steve I think yes and that's right right that was 1999 or something. So yeah. it was a tiny little room where the three of us could barely fit in. <laughs> but he had he had it set up like a studio. And, yeah. uh, I mean, that's even before all the laptops and the programming. So, I mean, actually, the last few records I made were at a friend of mine, John Loach's house. And he's got a beautiful, he does house concerts there. And the one we did with Rini Rosness, we recorded there. And I, my last few trio records. I still like going to a nice studio too. There are still nice studios in Toronto, uh, great engineers, you know. And that's what I wanted to actually go on. You're uh, jumping around because I, I really wanted to ask you about the uh, the art of the audio engineer. I, I noticed that when you do talk about your recordings, you do give full credit for the audio engineers. Tell me what the importance of it is. I was a big fan of, of uh, the great, uh, late great uh, Phil Sheridan because there was that specific sound to it and he gave that magical uh, sound to to the boss brass and uh, and to many of the recordings that are so sonically superior than other recordings that you that people were just to slap a few microphones and, and, and go at it. There's an art form to it. Tell me what the importance of that is. Very important because I don't really know much about the technical side of it. I know what I want it to sound like, but <laughs> you have to trust who's who's doing it, and they have to have the chops to to get the sound, you know, onto the well tape. It's not mm -hmm. tape anymore, is yeah. it? Um, very important because I think most musicians wanted to sound real and not overproduced anyway for this for this type of music at least, you know. And uh, yeah, there's there there are a, num a number of very excellent 
engineers in Toronto. So live recording, studio recording, which do you prefer? And, and, uh, and is, there, is there a huge difference, you know, when you have an audience in front of you um, as opposed to preparing something for, for tape, so to speak, for a recording? That's a good question. I never really thought about it. I'm pretty comfortable in the studio. I've done it so much. I like the control that you have. But of course, the live, there's an exciting energy from the live thing. But sometimes it's more challenging for the engineer. Right. <laughs> the, live, the live thing, right? <clears throat> you know? off, on, off, the, off the floor. <laughs> and there, there's actually a little more pressure in some ways with, the, I mean, you might think there's more pressure in the studio, but, you know, you can't really do another take with the live thing. You know, you're just playing and you hope you get enough good, good, good music. And I mean, you usually do, but, you know. I've done um, both. I've done both. So, uh, you know, as long as you're with good people, it's all good. What's your favorite horn that you like to play out of all the, the different horns you, uh, you, uh, you mastered? Well, I, I have the same tenor saxophone that I've had since grade eight. That's great. <laughs> same here. I've got the same, I got the same clarinet. And I just got it. Uh, I just got it overhauled because of COVID because I'm not, pl I'm not playing it. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it's a good time for an overhaul. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I've got a Selmer Mark VI that I, uh, my family doctor in Windsor, Nova Scotia, he passed away when I was in grade eight, and he had this horn. So my dad bought it. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, I was very lucky, you know, but I've got, I have, now I have four other tenors. I'm going to get rid of <laughs> Just as backup in case the one the one goes right. You got to have four tenors. I only had the one for a long time, but over the last twenty years or so, I started collecting a couple more. But I don't think I need all those. And I like playing soprano too. I have a Yannicka Sorrow good soprano. Listen, Mike, I, I know you have a, a a true appreciation, you know, uh, for this, and I want to ask because I I've made it my mantra in in my various uh, radio broadcasts and radio programs to talk about arranging and uh, you've done a couple of gorgeous uh, recordings including one with strings at the Glen Gould studio uh, what was that experience like uh, doing it in that setting uh, for that type of uh, genre well that was a big challenge but I, what a great opportunity was for me uh, I you know, I'd never arranged for strings before. Uh, I did four, arrange four arrangements, I think, and our guitarist, Reg Schwager, who, who had some experience, did four, the four other ones. Had a lot of help from the great Rick Wilkins, who uh, uh, Legendary, yes. Yeah, Yeah, and I, he's a friend of mine. I'm very lucky that he's a friend of mine, he, and he's one of the greatest arrangers Canada's ever produced. So he helped me out. He looked at me. <clears throat> He looked at my scores and he didn't change much, but he had some suggestions about, for example, uh, Mike with strings. Mm. You could write in every dynamic and articulation you want. It's not like a jazz lead sheet. <laughs> they want to know exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So I, you know, I did, and uh, it worked out pretty well. I mean, uh, considering I'd never done it before. <laughs> I, I'm pretty happy with it. That's wonderful. And just, yeah, just having that. I always wanted to record with strings. I, and it just kind of uh, fell on my lap. So it was, it, was, it was wonderful. Well, big bands used to use strings all the time. Artie Shaw, Tommy Dorsey, they, they, they use strings. And uh, it, it's something that isn't, uh, isn't used in, in big bands except for, you know, the Great American Songbook and the crooners and, and, and so forth. So in, in jazz, you, 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 don't, you don't hear that as much. Which brings me to uh, the stuff that you arrange for the University of Toronto Jazz uh, Jazz Band, um, oh, yeah. and uh, how is uh, arranging for 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 that in 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 that format? And you know, you don't hear many big bands around anymore. Just economically, it wasn't uh, it's not uh, feasible to 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 have a, a twenty two piece band or fifteen piece band tour around anymore. So you yeah. don't hear that uh, as much. And so, how is that? fine arranging, uh, you know, what was that experience like? Uh, once again, I did have some help from people. I had never really arranged much for big band, uh, but I did have a septet book that, uh, of my compositions that I'd done all the arrangements for. So it was basically just expanding on that and uh, wasn't, uh, wasn't too difficult. Um, 
you know, and now with the, the software, like we were talking about technology before, it's not like the old days where you have to hand write every part out. So, right. Uh, Use finale in a mouse click and you're, you're good, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, as far as big bands go, it's, yeah, there actually are still a lot of big bands. They're not touring, but yeah. uh, in, there's, a, there's a lot of like rehearsal bands in Toronto. Um, I mean, I think there's a different big band at the Rex every Monday night. So yeah, but uh, lots of people enjoy writing and just having that project and getting out and playing. So nobody's getting rich on it, but uh, you know, I, I play in the John McLeod big band, which has made. That's a stellar band. And yeah. I've heard they're, it's just absolutely wonderful. Yeah. A lot of the people that were in the boss brass or the younger generation or played with Rob are in that band. And, uh, you know, everybody in Toronto who arranges is influenced by Rob McConnell. So, Well, of course. And, you know, that brings me to another spot. So, you know, McConnell in 1999, you know, already started writing for the for the Ten Tet. Um, he decides to wrap up the Boss Brass after 30 plus years. And then you join the Ten Tet uh, in 2000, 2001 for their uh, Juno Award winning album. What was the experience like for playing in, in Rob's band? I mean, like everyone is a, is, a, is a jazz legend in their own right. I mean, you, you go up a couple of notches, if not more. And, and so how was it, you know, trading solos with, uh, with the likes of, uh, of the many musicians in the Ten Tet? Uh, I mean... I mentioned when we went to Toronto and I was in grade seven and eight, and I think in grade eight, we heard the boss brass. And that was one of the reasons, yeah. one of the reasons I wanted to play. So yeah. here I was on the stage with these guys, some of them, you know, with Rob and Guido and Terry Clark. And I mean, I it was one of the highlights of my life for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I learned so much from those guys, especially about, well, I, I learned about arranging from Rob just from listening to those arrangements of his that's uh i guess that's kind of when i started thinking about writing for my septet right uh, getting these i learned a lot just from hearing his on bandstand every night because once again that was still when we were playing weeks in clubs at the senator what a thrill oh. you know play with a band like that for six nights and and rob was a character himself oh my god <laughs> Like, I mean, uh, I saw things as a as a thirteen year old I shouldn't have seen in in, in concerts and, and stuff, you know, during the jazz fest, the Demore jazz fest, for that matter. And uh, yeah, he did not care who he was offending sometimes, <laughs> or if you know, if if the audience was too loud or whatever, he would just rip just in pipe the- down, pipe down, shut up, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to put it mildly, yes, yeah, yeah. It was uh, yeah a little unpredictable, but. Uh, he had a great heart and what a yeah you know, a legendary musician yeah great and underrated i don't want to say underrated player but i mean everybody talks about his arranging but what a player what a really underrated player. everything with the grammy awards and you know his tours and um uh, i believe in uh, in iceland and uh, and in california like everyone mel torme of course you know loved him so very much that had to bug everybody to uh, to listen to his arranger uh, arrangements and they're used you know stage band you know so mm-hmm. complex his his uh, his arranging and uh, you find something new every day totally. tell us a, tell us about your Ju- juno award winning uh, experience you know with the north and you recorded in copenhagen mm-hmm. and um you paid tribute to the late kenny wheeler who i first heard on kpm recordings in the early 70s um you know he was doing a lot of production music for for radio and and, and television at the time that's when i heard about you know uh, kenny wheeler and i was saw a documentary on you know montreal band leader vic vogel taking a bunch of international european musicians and putting them together in a room to universally play jazz for oscar peterson's 80th birthday so what is your experience of international musicians looking in on Canadian content and do they have a different perspective just because they're looking out in on, on, on some of the recordings with maybe your experience in the North? Um, the experience of international musicians? Looking yeah. At yeah. Like you, you, you played with some Scandinavian musicians I guess, oh, yeah. on, on that recording. Yeah. Um, 
I just think there's a mutual respect there. I mean, uh, the Kenny thing specifically was was more of a thing of us having some common ground, uh, given that Kenny recorded for the ECM label and spent a lot of time in Scandinavia. So that was your link, right? Yeah. Yeah, but although we we'd met before that, I mean. Uh, it was really more David Braid, who's my colleague, the pianist, who really has an international career going. Uh, he, he just is committed to traveling. And whether it's solo piano in China, he did a lot of that at uh, developing relationships all over the world. And uh, I think we were in, in Denmark with his uh, sextet. And that's where we met Anders Mogensen, the drummer who who's in the north. And it just kind of went from there. Um, so they, you know, they're kind of in a similar boat to us. We're, we're, we're Canadian, we're on top of the United States, but we don't actually work there that much. Because <laughs> <laughs> they don't really, I guess that's talking about how you're, you're getting back to your question. I mean, uh, Americans probably don't think they need Canadians I mean, they don't have enough work for themselves anyway, so. <laughs> well, what? It's, easy work, it's not easy to work in the States that you have to get this work visa. It usually costs more than the gig. I mean, I've done some things down there. But just talking about the similarity, they also have problems getting out of Scandinavia and into Germany. They're doing it, but, or France, you know. Uh, so we kind of came together and we would book a tour in Canada. They would book a tour in Scandinavia and, and then uh, we've also been to Australia and done some done some other things in, throughout Europe. But uh, I guess my question was, you know, just focusing on the fact that there's this is a great this is an American uh, piece of culture that yeah. everyone is interpreting out. And there's pockets. There's Canada. There's Scandinavia. There's Japan. There's uh, you know, uh, and they all are backed up by you know. In Japan, it's all the hi-fi companies. You know, you have Radio Netherland and, uh, uh, and so forth, and throughout Europe and and so forth. And somehow the Americans don't even want to. Well, in in my opinion, don't even appreciate you know the the culture that they have formed or built or nurtured. And you have all of these international countries that are coming in, feeding off the sort of the same uh, bit to uh, to 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 make this uh, genre flourish so i just wanted to find out if you know you're independently doing music in in canada and and other people are doing it in other countries if there are any different experiences that you that you might uh, want to bring forward to 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 talk about how they attack that particular uh, they attack jazz how the scandinavians oh, yeah their perspective. I mean, it is, it's fa actually just specifically Scandinavia is kind of fascinating because um, I would say that the Danes are more in the tradition. Um, they're really in more American um, because Ben Webster lived in Copenhagen and uh, uh, so Kenny Drew, a, a lot of a lot of uh, American musicians went and lived in Copenhagen, and there was a big influence of just right. playing tunes and swinging, and uh, and that does move into Sweden as well. But as you go further north, and you get more into this Nordic jazz, and you get into Norway, they've yeah. really got their own thing, right? Yeah, <laughs> it was developed a lot, you know, or at least documented on the ECM label, right. which is a sound, you know. Uh, and beautifully documented. Europe, and it's European jazz. That's yeah. European jazz. Sure, it's influenced, but, uh, you know, you don't really hear the Count Basie, Duke Ellington no. in the forefront of that music. No. You know? no. So I find that interesting from an ethnomusicology perspective, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think Canada, of course, we're heavily influenced by American. Absolutely. Uh, you know, but it's different. I think it's subtly different. But, you know, in Toronto, I mean, if, in Montreal, before I was born, there was Lester Young and Billie Holiday and uh, Miles Davis and everyone regularly played in Canada. So it was, there's a border, but, you know, geographically, it's, it was connected, obviously. 
So you've been uh, with the, the faculty of uh, University of Toronto since 1993, and then uh, last year in the TD Halifax Jazz Festival, I introduced you with the, the great uh, Dave Liebman, who you've uh, brought in as a visiting adjunct professor there. Uh, tell me what his influence and, um, and what it has uh, done to contribute to the educational uh, standpoint of uh, your teaching. Oh, well, he was another very influential teacher who I met early on. I mean, he said I met Don Palmer in the late 70s, but then in 1983, I, like a lot of young musicians in Canada, we would go to the Banff Jazz Workshop. I did that for two summers. And Liebman was there both summers. And Dave Holland ran it. Kenny Wheeler was there. John Abercrombie. And that really opened my eyes to uh, their more contemporary approach to or post Coltrane whatever I, I I suppose now that's not contemporary. <laughs> <laughs> but, Elvis uh, is easy listening so I guess Coltrane <laughs> can be can be considered as classic. <laughs> yeah and Liebman is a real yeah. authentic link to Coltrane for sure. I mean he played with Elvin Jones in the early 70s. Elvin was Coltrane's drummer and he played with Miles in, in the early 70s and of course Coltrane played with Miles. So um, and he was one of the first jazz, you know, guys to really get into jazz education in terms of figuring out that language, you know, and has written books on it. It's taught at Manhattan School of Music. So, uh, yeah, he helped unlock some of those sounds for me. And uh, he's an incredible teacher, uh, and, and, you know, an incredible energy incredible energy about him musically and as a teacher and uh, it was a, so what a great opportunity for our students at U of T to, we basically did his course at from Manhattan School of Music at U of T with in, I, I taught when he wasn't there but he came up three or four times a year and you know would lecture for like eight hours a day <laughs> wow. uh, anyway um, we were very lucky to have him. And then to do that recording at the kind of at the end of his uh, tenure there was, uh, was great. Yeah. Um, well, we're, uh, we're, we're coming to the, uh, the closure, but I, I, I don't want to finish this interview before talking about, you know, your l latest recordings and, uh, and what you've got planned uh, going up. But tell us just a little bit about, uh, you, you mentioned a bit about Rainy Rosas and, uh, and taking flight and, uh, it's, it, and how that experience was uh, with collaborating with her. Oh, what she is amazing. Uh, a force knew, to be reckoned with. <laughs> just a, what a, a lovely person uh, and incredible pianist. Her ears are, I mean, that's the really amazing thing about Rini. She can hear anything. She was, I, I did spend a little time in New York too in the late 80s. I had a Canada Council grant and studied more with Liebman and Dave Holland then. But I lived in the same neighborhood as Rini in Brooklyn. Oh. So I got to know her a bit then. We didn't play that much, a few jam sessions, but she was already playing with Joe Henderson and Wayne Shorter. <laughs> yeah, okay. with Another class, she played yeah. With she played with everyone. I mean, yeah. and uh, we had her as a guest at U of T with the, with the big band a few years ago, and we, we talked about trying to get a recording going. So this was the result of that. She's basically a guest with my trio, yeah. with uh, Steve Wallace and Red Shorter. And Jim Vivian plays on some tracks too. And it was a, just a nice, comfortable session at my friend John Loach's home. He has an incredible piano. His wife's a classical pianist. So, and she's old friends with them too. So it was just very comfortable. And we set up and just played. Some, we talked about some songs in advance and sent music back and forth. And I think it worked out quite well. Yeah. And uh, yeah. No, I wanted to uh, uh, find out, uh, you know, during COVID, you've had, you know, about four months of uh, of solitude, so to speak, like a lot of people have um, creatively. Have you, uh, are you uh, continuing on with that and any, any future projects that you uh, might have if, if and when things uh, do open up or, uh, or the possibilities? There's always lots of ideas in my head. I mean, right now, the next thing I really have booked is we're supposed to go back to uh the tour was canceled in april promoting our kenny wheeler record with the north and norma winstone who is a vocalist 
who worked with Kenny, and I know her. Well, she recorded with the Maritime Jazz Orchestra, she and Kenny, and we made a couple of records with, with them. So I've always wanted to work with her. She was booked on this tour too. So we're going to try to do that again next late April. We'll see if it happens. Uh, after the school year, I'm basically, you know, frankly, I'm focused on the school year right now. Yeah. Just how are we going to, re you know. And how are you going to do it through Zoom? <laughs> how are you going to sync up all these musicians? <laughs> well, I mean, we're going to try to do some things live and I'm, I'm yeah. hoping we can't like, of course, ensembles, we're going to try. But uh, yeah, but of course, those are going to be online, like most universities, you know. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, frankly, that's been <laughs> the forefront of my, my thinking right now. Not but I'm still head. practicing writing, yeah, that, that, you know, everything's kind of on hold for the time being. Mike, uh, one last thing. I wanted to uh, you to give, tell me a little bit of your experiences of the Halifax Jazz Festival as we, you know, kind of wrap things up and and so forth. And you played in various different groups, and also, you know, your cohorts, uh, Steve Wallace and uh, Red Schwager, and uh, and all your, your all your buddies uh, tend tend to come here. And I've introduced you in various different capacities. Tell me a little bit of your experiences of, of the the Halifax Jazz Festival over the years. Well, I think I must have played there every summer. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, here he comes again. <laughs> Hunter, but who, I guess Donnie started it, but I think Susan picked it up pretty soon afterwards. And uh, she was such a supporter of, of me and other Canadian musicians. But uh, especially, I guess, since I was from there and Kirk McDonald too. Um, you know, she really supported us. And I had a, found some gig for us every year. You, you know, I mean, I, I think of the I played there with Ed Dickard, and Guido, and uh, Metalwood, and <laughs> Barry Elms, and uh, my own group. You know, there was always the Maritime Jazz Orchestra. Holy cow! So lucky to be able to go home and and play. Uh, I mean, yeah. It, oh, especially at the age I was at to have that opportunity. You know, she was a big, uh, big supporter. Well, Mike, the, oh, not just her, the whole community there was lovely. It's a, it's a fen phenomenal community and it's, and it's growing and the legacy of Dawn and, you know, and, and musicians such as yourself, you know, uh, come back year after year and, and grace us with uh, what I call, you know, Christmas time for me in July because um, you know you, you are in a very important figure to maintain and upkeep the uh, the, the jazz culture here in Canada, and uh, and you do it uh, not only locally but uh, internationally. And so, uh, I just want to thank you for all of your contributions that you that you have in in, in many different aspects. As I've uh, mentioned in my opening, you know you have to be versatile in in uh, in various different genres of jazz just to you know keep afloat <laughs> and uh, um and and you do it in, so well in so many different ways so I, I really really do want to thank you so very much uh and i've never officially have done that to to you so i'm glad i could use this medium <laughs> thank you very much thank you yeah well, I, I wish you all the luck and uh, and uh, best wishes in this new school year of yours. And uh, I I know that uh, also Phil Nimmons, uh, the grand old Phil Nimmons, has just just turned uh, what is it ninety seven? Is it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, something like that. So uh, uh, please say hello to him if you do see him, and uh, and Red Schwager and all those uh, people in Toronto. And uh, we will be looking forward to your future projects uh, very very soon. Okay. Yeah, hopefully. Yes. <laughs> actually, actually, I I don't know what's going on with the home my home bay festival, but anyway, I was okay. supposed to play down there in October, but I'm I'm not holding my breath at this point. Yeah, uh, everything's kind of up in the air I during. Did, I, I said my next booking was April, but I guess that is my next booking. <laughs> 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 so I was thinking with the bubble, you know, we're not in the Atlantic bubble yet, so. Not you. You have to come and quarantine when you're here. Know, so that's so you're, Nova Scotia. <laughs> Unless something radical happens, it'll be next summer, I guess. So. Exactly. Take care. I take take care, Mike, and I hope to see you very soon. Okay. Thanks. See you then. Bye bye now. <laughs>